This episode of Digital Photography Cafe is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera, and by Daisy Grip, for a child's smile for a photographer's camera. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe. I'm Trevor Curry, your digital marketing guy. And I'm Joseph Christina, your professional photographer. So grab a latte, pull up a chair, and join us as we chat about the art and business of photography. So hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Last week we talked about Apple's new patents, how to get B2B leads with social media, and tips for shooting a male headshot. If you haven't listened to last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it on iTunes, listen in your car through Stitcher Radio, or simply head over to our website, digitalphotographycafe.com, and listen online. So, Joe, we are back, episode 68. How you doing, man? 68, we are here. Yes. Doing well. You know, you rattled off some uh, places where you can find our show, but we're in a new place now. I heard. We are actually in TuneIn Radio, so it's TuneIn.com. That's very exciting. I love TuneIn Radio because TuneIn is really cool. It's a full, like, broadcaster i mean they are on sonos roku squeeze box they're on all the android blackberry iphone ipad basically everywhere in your car of course yep. just like stitcher radio and of course all your home media stuff has um has tune in so it's yeah great like the smart to be there. tvs or the the blu-ray players with the apps all those places a lot exactly. tune in is on a lot of those devices exactly so now you can actually go into that app Search for Digital Photography Cafe, and boom, we're right there. You yeah, can listen 60, to our show right there. 68 shows as of um, Monday, so that's perfect, perfect. And talking about apps, our app that will be on the actual smart TVs, seven different manufacturers' TVs in 22 countries, is only weeks away. That's exciting. Weeks, yeah, that's right. We're getting real close yep. to that, too. So you'll be able to see exciting. our ugly mugs soon <laughs> to a TV near you. Yes, that's, that's right. That's cool. <laughs> very, very cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we got some really good news, um, kind of little news items that kind of came through this week, which is kind of fun. And uh, one of them that was really interesting is this uh, new Nikon, right? Yeah, this Nikon Cool Picks. What is it? Uh, S800C. Right. So it's the first, it's like a point and shoot camera. You look at it from the front, it looks like every other point and shoot out there. Right. But the back of it, is a three and a half inch LCD touchscreen, but it's Android powered. I'm it's you know not, it's not like Nikon powered. It actually right. uses the Android operating system. This is just friggin' cool. Okay, so guys, you, you're listening to this. Just listen, listen to this. This will be the first camera, okay, that gets um, on the chopping block by Apple, and they sue <laughs> Nikon. <laughs> so yeah. you know um, that'll be on the list. Yeah, that will be on the list because right now we know that, of course, Samsung. Samsung and, and Apple are currently in court for like ever now, you know, yeah. fighting back and forth about, you know, the phone and, you know, Apple doesn't want basically anything, you know, the, any of the Samsung stuff coming over any of their phones and they're saying it's their, you know, intellectual property. It's their, this whole big thing. And right now, as we're uh, recording this show, the court, you know, the, the jury is out del- deliberating. So by next week, we'll be able to say, okay, did Apple win? Or did Samsung win or is it something down the middle? And I think that's right. really going to be tell t- it's going to be a real interesting sign on how the industry goes as far as the phones go. But then also how these how these cameras, these new cameras go, because like this cam, yeah. this camera has Android running on it. But that means it's going to be running Android apps, which is really cool. That's a great yeah. way to brick your camera during a wedding. I think that'd be great. <laughs> You know, well, if you're using this camera to shoot professionally, then yeah, you probably you got shouldn't. other problems, I think. But yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it's got you know built-in Wi-Fi, so you can connect to the internet. You can browse the web with the with the built-in web browser. You can run internet-enabled apps. Right. Um, it's got you know, let's go through 16 megapixel sensor, 10 times optical zoom. Of course, it shoots 1080p video. What doesn't nowadays? Sure. Um, it's, it's really a neat idea. But Very my cool. question is. I mean, they're kind of treading on the iPod Touches turf here a little bit. Yeah, that's that suit I was telling you about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. now the iPod Touch, it's got the tiny little camera and the tiny little sensor. I mean, no no optical zoom or anything on it, whereas this Nikon really is a camera first, I think, and then, you know, a smart device second. <sighs> yeah. um, but, you know, I mean, 
are they going in the right direction? I mean, is this really the way point and shoot cameras should move? I mean, everybody's got smartphones nowadays that does all of the apps, that does the web browsing, and it does it over, you know, the mobile network, 3G, 4G. Yeah. Um, are they kind of building another device? I mean, this is not a small device. I mean, the iPod touches are thin, they're compact, you slip them in your pocket. This is a little bit heftier. So this isn't yeah. something you're going to stick in your back pocket, you know? It kind of reminds me of um, this new, like, for example, you know, uh, one of the one of the things that we were going to talk about, and this kind of makes me think about this, is the new Fuji, right? Fuji is mm -hmm. coming out with this XE1 they were, they were talking about, and there was a leak on it. Um, I forgot who did the leak, but we'll put it up. Uh, if you're if you're watching, um, you can take a look. If not, we'll throw in the show, no the show notes. Um, but anyways, it's called the Fuji X. E1. And it's something in between the old, you know, what was it, the X100 and the, the brand new, the X Pro one. So it's somewhere in between. Right. Now, remember, the X100 is discontinued. We're thinking that an X200 is going to be coming out very, very soon, especially uh, right around Photokina um, time. But regardless, these are still cameras that they look like the old school camera, but they do not have a viewfinder. Right. They right. and or they have a viewfinder that's all digital and you're kind of looking at what they want you to look at with like a heads up display. It's like, just give me a prism. I'm, I'm fine. You know, give me something that's at least close, even if it's an 80 percent or a 90 or even a 95 percent. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Right. I don't I don't want the digital, you know, the whole that whole digital viewfinder. It, it's just for me, I just don't care for it. But yeah, so now we're going to be going into this camera that basically the back end of it now is an entire what? iPod, you know, touch. Yeah. Uh, or an Android, yeah, I mean, you know. it pretty much is. And, and, but, that, but I guess that begs to, you know, are you going to carry two devices around with you? Are you going to carry right. this loaded, you know, point and shoot camera from Nikon that can do all the apps that's Wi Fi enabled and a smartphone? Right. Or would you rather have your smartphone with a basic point and shoot camera that, you know, is going to, just do what it's designed to do. Yeah, and shoot I, pictures. You know, I'm thinking that these smartphones are are going to the sensors in these smartphones are going to get bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. and the quality um, that we're going to see coming out of these um, smartphones is going to get better and better. And it's th these cameras are going to have a hard time to you know to stay alive, so to speak. I I, I think that it, these smartphones eventually will become like the camera in your pocket that is so good. And that does such a good job. I mean, eventually, if you could you imagine like, you know, something even like a micro, you know, four thirds in your pocket. Or could you sure. imagine there's a big monster, you know, APS-C sensor, you know, in your pocket in a, in a camera. But who, who knows? They, you know, as this technology gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's a possibility. And, you know. Well, we're, we're getting closer and closer. I mean, that the EOS right. uh, M uh, mirrorless that awesome. we talked about. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, that is a small body with a full uh, APS-C sensor in it. Right. So, right. yeah, I mean, it is it is doable. Um, when it's going to happen, who knows? I mean, you're going to have people that are going to want a regular standalone point and shoot camera that they can bring with them and stick in their pocket and then have it right. separate from their phone. But you're going to find, I think, more of the techie people sure. are going to say, you know what? The phone in my camera is amazing. I don't want to carry around a separate device. Yeah. And if I want to make really good images, I'm going to carry around the big camera. Yeah, you I know, think, where you I know, can put my lenses I, on it and stuff. I think Nikon and Canon should just basically take like, you know, a D800 or take a, you know, one of the 5D Mark III's and um, just stick wireless, wireless phone in there and we just hold up our camera, <laughs> you know, and say, hey, what's going on? You know, yeah, and, that, really and that's it. That and we just, yeah, just forget about all this. Just carry around, a, I mean, a DSLR and I'll be happy, you know, as a yeah, photographer. Yeah, that around your neck all day. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you know, you know, back in the day, the old telephones were probably bigger <laughs> than a, than a, uh, a D800, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. true, true. Remember those things, the big monsters? They but you know nice. what? Okay, so now we're, we're taking pictures, right? Now, what the heck do we do with them? And I saw another story that came um, up this week, and they were talking about Pinterest. And we did, a, we, you know, we did a little piece on Pinterest, I don't know, a bunch of shows back. I don't know, maybe we can link to it. But, um, you know, it's getting a lot of traction lately. And, you know, it's, it's the whole idea with Pinterest, you know, it's copyright versus exposure. 
Um, right. You know, you're you're yep. kind of giving away some copyright, but you're getting a ton of exposure. You know, should you do it? Shouldn't you do it? And, you know, it's kind of I'm on, you know, I'm kind of on the fence with it, but I'm seeing, you know, companies like Land's End, like Nordstrom's um, be big, large, you know, um, stores that are using Pinterest as a way to do, for example, like a holiday cat catalog, a wish list and stuff sure. like this. And they're driving a ton of traffic, especially with women. Pinterest right, is very, right. you know. So well, as, I think with know, Pinterest and companies like that, let's say, um, you know, women will like, you know, grab these images from their website, put them on a pin board for fashions that they like. Sure. You know what? The, the company is happy to let them do that. Because really, what are they going to do with that image? I right. mean, they're not going to print it out and hang it on their wall, right? Some some woman wearing a, a cute dress that they like. Right. I mean, right. they don't care about that. They just want to have easy reference for it. They want to be able to share it with their friends and stuff. Now, when it comes to a photographer, what are we sharing? We're sharing our artwork. You right. know, now we start putting our artwork out there and people start pinning it. That's great. It's great for exposure, but it opens up to the possibility of your images being stolen, used elsewhere, you know, without your permission. Yeah, there's, and, and we always talk about that too. You know, there's one, there's one area in Pinterest policies that they just need to work on. And there's a single word in there and the word is sell. Yep. And if they would remove that word sell out of it, uh, I would be okay with it. But, you know, I don't care if they go and repurpose, reuse, and they do all kinds of stuff. But as soon as they put sell, um, as you know, you said you, you're uploading an image and now they have the ability to possibly sell that image at that point, you know, it kind of turns me off a little bit. So they have yeah, some work to cool. do. Um, you know, the, the attorneys that they are, you know, that are working on this and then the, the, the company itself, they just need to think about it in, in this type of thing. I mean, there has been, you know, people writing articles about this and they're, they're looking at it as like back in the eighties, you know, the, the idea of people stealing music in nine, you know, nineties, the beginning nineties. And then right. finally in the whole, you know, Napster days where you were just stealing music here, you know, they're looking at it as like, oh, these people are stealing images and there's now people that are putting no Pinterest on their websites where you cannot pin anything from their website at all it's like code so you know um, it's kind of it's to me it's it's you know like for example if you are um a caterer or you're like a uh some type of wedding professional that makes a specific product like a cake maker or something right. and you put all these gorgeous beautiful custom cakes that people can order throughout the country and you can deliver them. I think it's awesome. But this is all it takes is yeah. one bride that's famous, you know, that goes yep. and pins your specific cake that leads them back to your website and you're, you've won. Well, <laughs> you, see, that's, and that's exactly right. I mean, that beautiful image represents the product that you sell. Right. So you're selling a cake. You're not selling images for a living. You're selling a cake for a living. Exactly. So you really don't, as the cake, manufacturer you really don't care spread that image around let it be all over the place it's more traffic coming exactly. back to our website and you could think the same way for a photographer well a photographer sells their images so your images are your work so hey let's spread it around and show everybody our work right um but it's really not the same thing because realistically if you're a wedding photographer and you're putting images up there of somebody's wedding that you shot i mean People don't know that couple. They're right. not personally connecting with exactly. the photo, with the people in the photo. Exactly. They may look at it and say, yeah, it's a great looking photo, but are but they're not really connecting with it for the people that are in it. Exactly. So, so you're kind of, they're kind of have this disconnect there. So is it really a beneficial? Now, if you start putting it up there and people start actually stealing your images and using it for things, well then, you know, I would say Pinterest is not, or yeah, then it becomes a detriment. Them. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. And I think it's it's the product. It definitely is a product. So let's say mm -hmm. if you're doing something special with your wedding photography and you're doing, for example, you know, all underwater weddings, let's say, I don't know, something crazy like that. And you're and you're actually doing um, this type of thing. Now, those images are going to be so unique, so special, so different that mm -hmm. chances are they're going to get pinned a lot and right. they're going to be led back to your website. And Hey, if you do underwater weddings, you know, maybe who knows, maybe you'll, you'll get business from it. But if you're sure. just doing, like you're saying, you know, 
uh, you know, Bob and Jane's wedding. Well, no one wants to see Bob and Jane unless you do something absolutely spectacular or special. Right. Now, if you're a commercial photographer, well, you know, you're putting ads up there. That's fine. Or like I said, you're the cake vendor or you're or maybe you're a venue and you have like images of, you know, the location sure. itself. There's a lot yeah. of, but I think it definitely, like you said, it comes back to a product. If you're selling a product, it's a great place to be. Just like I said, Land's End, Land's End, you got Nordstrom and a lot of other ones that are using it to put their products up online to get people to come back, to right. have these women, you know, repin um, these, uh, these items and it leads them back to the website. So, I mean, no matter what, I think it's good promotion, period. Yes. Yes, and you always have, you can always watermark. Yeah, Put your absolutely. watermarks on your images like we always talk about. Maybe they need to be a little bit more in into the center of the, the subject as opposed right. to tucked nice down in the lower corner or something you know, um, for that little bit of added protection. But right. you know, that's that's definitely another way to do it. Talk, talking about watermarks, I read an article and we weren't even going to talk about it, but I, it just brings, brings something up to me. You know, the FBI now released you know the the watermark like you see on video games and on music and on the back it says uh, you know anti piracy it's like this big yeah, yellow big FBI monster yeah. FB, yeah. FBI warning well guess what photographers are now allowed to use that watermark that warning on our work now i don't oh, know nice. who in their right mind would take that big ugly thing and stick it on their work but the bottom line is is we are now as rights owners you know as a copyright owner able to stick that fbi warning on her work nice or maybe on the back of our work like we're I don't know, fbi how approved <laughs> yeah we're, we're the photographers are fbi you know anti-piracy approved so yeah there we god, go god can you imagine great so. well you know it's been a while since we talked about google plus right um but it was just something that uh i found i thought you know we should probably just mention it um google plus is now finally doing custom urls so a right. few of the um, verified accounts, you know, personals and, and uh, pages are now able to um, get these vanity URLs. And awesome. apparently they're going to be rolling them out over time. But right now the verified people are the only ones that, that uh, are getting it. Right. And that's hard to get verified. So I would say um, like right now we have our Google plus connected to, we basically bought our own URLs. Like um, right. you have, you know, G plus uh, TC. I have G plus JC.com. Right. And right. if you go there, it takes them directly to our big, long, nasty, long, yeah. you know, <laughs> 25 care, you know, mean. 25 character number that represents you or represents me. So right. we, we've basically kind of, you know, rigged it ourselves, but eventually we're going to be able to have this and that's good. They, they, they needed to do this a year ago. I don't know yep. what, what they're doing. I mean, Facebook did it pretty, you know, pretty quickly, I think. I think it's just a slow um, rollout of all the different features, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it's good to see that they're doing it. Um, you know, it's just, it'll be a while before your average person can get it. I mean, if you're verified or you want to get verified, um, there is a form that you can fill out and we'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out. But, uh, you know, it's a whole process that they can verify your identity and everything. And if you get verified, um, you may be able to get one of these custom URLs sooner rather than later. Right. So unless you're Britney Spears or someone, well, you know, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you're probably not going to get verified anytime soon. No, no. But anyways, I tell you what, before we go any further, let's go ahead and hear from one of our sponsors. Have you ever tried to photograph a child who was on the move and wouldn't settle down? A child who just wouldn't give your camera the time of day no matter what tricks you tried? If so, we have some great news for you. Introducing the Daisy Grip, your go-to tool for capturing a child's smile. Just think of the Daisy Grip as your third hand. Just place it into your camera's hot shoe, insert the child's favorite toy or puppet, and let the smiles begin. Imagine the storytelling magic that you'll have at your disposal with a ferocious lion or a friendly monster sitting on top of your camera. For the ultimate attention getter, place your smartphone into the Daisy Grip and play the child's favorite cartoon. With the addition of a Daisy Grip bracket, you can free up your hot shoe for a flash or wireless transmitter. Let Daisy Grip put the space above your lens to work for you. Make this indispensable tool your new best friend. Head over to daisygrip.com forward slash DPC to get the listener discount. The Daisy Grip, for a child's smile, for a photographer's camera. 
All right, we're back. So, Joe, I was doing some um, research on Twitter this week. Right. And, you know, I'm kind of feeling out, you know, what people's interests are in portfolio websites. So I asked the question, when you created your photography portfolio website, what was the most important element it had to have? So I've been getting a ton of feedback over the last few days. I've been tweeting it out a lot because, you know, I really want to I really want to get an idea. I mean, this is what this is part of what I do for a living is design and build websites Right. And, you know, f- photographer websites as well. I mean, is, is it sure you know, as well as like regular business websites and stuff. So um, I got a lot of really great feedback. So I just wanted to kind of share some of this with you because I know you've been talking about your portfolio site. And I, and I know this really is a huge topic for people. Yeah. So. And, and I'm right now in the middle of a complete redesign. Right. Um, I'm basically right. taking the entire business, chopping it up you know, doing, doing all kinds of things to kind of switch things around and just have yep. a lot of, a lot of different things going on. And one of the things is exactly that is developing, um, a brand new, um, entity, a, you know, kind of a rebrand, um, so to speak, but yeah, right. it's, it's important. It's very important. And we know we're always making fun of the photographers, you know, especially the before live books actually had HTML five going on. And they'd right. have like a live book site and the whole thing would be flash. And then, you know, someone, a client would be on their iPad or iPhone or any I, anything, you know, besides, the, besides the computer. And yeah, yeah, and you would get nothing basically. Or right. you'd get some some horrendous HTML coded site that just was awful. Or they would just go ahead and put a flash site up, not even live books that kind of falls back a little bit to HTML. Um, right. That would just do nothing. <laughs> it would just bump, bump, bump. Yeah. There'd be nothing there well, at all. Well, you know, it's... So, Overall, overall, most people said they want websites with no flash. Right. I think everybody's really starting to get it and say, you know, these flash elements just are too, even if it works, even if you have a smartphone or a device that flash works on, aside sure. from a desktop. I mean, on a desktop, you got a pretty good experience, but right. on a smaller, low powered uh, mobile device, flash just does not work well yeah and even I mean, with an older desktop trevor i mean oh, yeah. i have i have a six-year-old imac that i that i have uh just i yep. actually got a couple of different older machines and even that flash is just a hog it's a pig and yeah. it just it yeah. just does it just not bogs it work down. well it bogs and then instead of transitions working they're stutter stepping you're doing ken burns that looks like yeah it's like jumping yeah yeah it's just nah, it's, it's horrible cool. yeah well photos over overall Everybody that answered, like the number one thing they said, photos are the main focus. They don't exactly. want all the the sidebars. They don't want all the widgets. They don't want all these other things that are taking your eye away from the photos. They want right. the photos to be front and foremost. I'm with and, them. I'm with them on that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And now, um, you know, people are really wanting these um, responsive uh, templates, these responsive designs. So that way they don't have to create two separate websites, one for desktops and one for mobiles, exactly. or, or they don't want to have to run the plugins that kind of do a stripped down conversion and make your, your site plugin friendly you know, or mobile right. friendly. Right. So, so if any, if, if you don't know what responsive is out there, just, just imagine any of the sites you've been to, let's say it's a photography site and, um, you have it full screen. You go to a window size and then you go and you take the bottom and you just pull it and you drag it to any size and the image in the window, the image that's on the site actually changes its size, its, its proportion um, based yeah, on the layout changes. The layout, exactly. Yeah. So what that means is if you're on an iPhone, it still looks great. If you're on an iPad, yeah. it looks great in a vertical mode and it also looks great in a horizontal mode. It changes on the fly, hence the name responsive. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, a couple other things, they want the ability to uh, sell images on their site. So some type of e-commerce integration. Right. Um, for like more of the fine artists that are actually doing one-off prints and they want to sell. I mean, obviously, if you're selling wedding products, um, you're probably going to want to integrate with a fulfillment house, somebody right. that's going to be able to do all of your printing needs. Um, but if you're doing one-off fine art that you're selling, um, having your own built-in e-commerce is great. And really sure. the last big thing is private customer galleries. You know, it seems yep. like people are trying to keep it, keep their galleries, their customer galleries under one roof right. as opposed to having to integrate with a third-party service. 
Right, right. And there's a lot of third party services out there and they all take a percentage sure. um, or they take a monthly fee. So if you can do it all in one place, well, you know, save yourself a few bucks. You save yourself money and, um, you know, you're able to put those images all in, you know, in your website, not to ha have to have it somewhere else um, yep. also. And then you're uploading them into multiple locations here. You keep it all under one roof. That's so, right. Uh, I think that's, that's right. I think that's awesome. Now, you know, there is a downside to putting it all under one roof, doing it your, yourself instead of having someone else do it and some other stuff. And that gets into security. But I tell you what, before we get into security, let's take one more break and uh, and then we'll get kind of we'll, we'll kind of delve into that a little bit. Are you frustrated with slightly out of focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. Sorry, guys, we are back. So I was kind of alluding to the idea of this, you know, security issue and doing everything yourself. And, you know, something kind of uh, came out right around August 3rd. And some of you people are painfully aware of it. And that is this exploit in a PHP um, package called Tim Thumb. Yeah. Yeah. Not, that thing is bad news. Not um, fun. Tim Thumb is a PHP script that's actually used by a lot of themes and a lot of plugins for right. doing uh, dynamic imagery sizing. So a lot of times when you'll upload a big picture, um, right. high resolution, that way it can be seen real large on screen, but then you have thumbnail versions. Now, WordPress has their own thumbnail built-in thumbnail generator. Right. But a lot of these plugins, like slideshow plugins and things like that, actually use their own script to create the thumbnails. Right. And Tim Thumb is one of these popular scripts that they use. And Tim Thumb has been notoriously, you know, leaky for security. And uh, I guess uh, the right people finally found the... <laughs> the breach and exploited God. it and it's been yeah. a big mess it's been pretty bad so like august 3rd is when this kind of hit and it hit hard and you know it's not just wordpress um it's many different uh, like you were saying themes and packages that use this tin sure thumb. other content management systems like joomla, joomla. Um, any, anything where yeah. there are scripts involved where it's there's php coding um, there is the possibility that Tim, Tim Thumb could be used in it. Yeah, and you know, and that's the key, PHP. Um, yes. PHP is notorious for being, you know, buggy or, or right. you know, there's a lot of exploits that have come up through both Java um, files as well as PHP. And PHP is just, just notorious because PHP is so powerful. Um, yes. It gives people the ability to do things remotely um, on a server box that they could do right from their right from their their computer where they're sitting. So it right. it has it has the ability to basically take control, um, access files, um, become users that it's not, and basically yeah. traverse um, an OS, an operating system, through different folders and all kinds. Of, okay, so let's not let, we don't want to we don't want to say that this is a uh, WordPress exploit, but let's just say the majority of the photographers out there are using WordPress and not Joomla. So let's just make believe we're talking to <laughs> WordPress people right. out there. But sure. that's, that is the majority. So the way this thing would work is it would come in through a Tim the the Tim um, Thumb exploit. It would come in as a PHP file, and then the the attacker the script would execute and when it execute it would copy itself into multiple directories on on the server within that specific domain um, and can stick itself all the way from the root 
all the way through the top level domain of, let's say, a theme package. Uh, right. Let's say a, some type of temp file in a theme package. So once it's in there, um, it creates basically this executable PHP file that allows the attackers to get in and do all kinds of stuff. Right. Really, really nasty stuff. So And I'm, it replicates itself, like you said, right. and puts it in all of these other areas. So you may find one and delete it, but then there's another one sitting there. Right. So what it does is it'll call home. You know, it'll phone home with the directory um, structure of where it stuck itself in all of the other entities and people. Can, and then the attacker can basically, if you delete one, it'll just go and find the other one, then go replicate itself again as soon as it yep. executes that PHP file all over again. Um, the problem with this is, is it lies dormant. So if you don't know that you have, you know, the uh, a vulnerable Tim Thumb, um you can basically use, as you would say, a plugin for that, right? There is a plugin for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll have a link in the in the show notes, but it's actually called Tim Thumb Vulnerability Scanner. Right. And it basically is a plugin. You install it in WordPress, and it will in, it will scan your entire WordPress install. Right. And see a if you're using Tim Thumb. It'll rec it'll tell you whether it's a vulnerable version of the script. Right. And if it is, it gives you a one click button to update it to the most recent version. Which is uh, which is awesome. which is good. But is that's awesome. not gonna help you if the hacker's already gotten to your box. No. Now at that point, um, I mean, you know, I'm a Unix guy, so you know, I get in there and you know, take a look at how this stuff works. And, and, and I have a lot of stuff that goes on in the back end so that this doesn't happen. But, you know, a lot of people are not Unix, you know, admins for, you know, 20 years. So it's, right. it's not going to be that easy. But the bottom line is, is if you do have a vulnerable version, then obviously immediately upgrade it. Possibly there might be an exploit. There might be the hack. There might be a PHP that's sitting there you know, and it, what happens, the bad part is it sits dormant until yep. the attacker wants to use it and they have a list of IPs. What this right. pro, what this thing does, which is really interesting and kind of cool, is it goes in and it creates another file in your root directory. And in that file, it goes and sticks every single IP address that comes to your URL. It does like all kinds of like crazy things and it, it really monitors what's going on. Um, I mean, there's been people that basically are sitting there with it, the exploit on there and nothing's happened. And then there's, I've, I've talked to people that have lost, you know, two years worth of blog entries and their yeah. website is completely yeah. junk. I um, can't even imagine that. I mean, and, current yeah. photographer has been around since October of 2009. I mean, we've got thousands sure. of articles on our site. I just right. can't imagine losing all, all gone. that. I mean, it's just not fixable. It's not repairable. Yeah. No, and once it embeds into, you know, a database or it could just delete your database, it can do all kinds of yeah. just nasty, nasty stuff. I tell you what, one of the one of the biggest things that I saw that was just unbelievable is um, the, the biggest exploit that I've seen with this thing is they went in and instead of just, you know, doing it. So basically what this thing does is it does an injection. So it'll go and let's say it'll take um, your dot ht access file if you know what it is. If you don't, basically it's a file that um, uh, tells the directory how to function, what things could be executed in that directory, who has the ability to execute them, how, when, why, what. This is right. what it does. It can go in there and change that completely. Go into your index.html file, completely change that. Put um, um, a PHP type of um, hack code in there so that it replicates all kinds of stuff. But the nastiest yeah. one that I've seen so far is it took over the server. It went ahead and changed the AT access um, uh, file to basically say this specific directory can only be accessed in Brazil. Okay, based on IP addresses by um, by class C's. Anyways. Um, that means only people in Brazil will be able to access this specific uh, directory. And then in that directory, it created a phishing site for the Brazil bank. So what that right. means is, let's say you're currentphotographer.com. If they go to currentphotographer.com slash Bank of America slash Brazil or whatever, they you know create some big long yep. URL, um, they would be basically sitting at a site that looks just like the Brazil bank. And yep. the 
And you would never know that it's there because you can't access it because your IP address is based in the US. Now the people in Brazil, they can access this fake Brazil uh, bank site, which is sitting on your computer, right? right. And they're yep. sitting there get, gathering username and passwords of people and phoning home with all of this data and they're using you to do it. The, yeah, that was, that's exactly. One the, and then what happens is Google scans your websites. Right. You know, they scan your site. That That's how they index your copy, right? So they, sure. they're scanning your site. And if they find what looks like is malicious software, malware, spyware, anything on your server, it will blacklist you and you're yeah. done. You're done. I mean, your your site goes dead. If somebody you, types in your URL, um, they get a page that, this, that says this site is suspected of uh, phishing and malware and blah, blah, blah. And, and you're done. I mean, you've got to get in there and find where the malware is get it removed and then you have to submit through to google and let them right. know that the problem's been taken care of then they'll and rescan you they'll rescan and it. if you're clean then you're good to go and if there's still one of those phps in there that's hidden yep. it's going to redo it all over again and then you're going to be yep. blacklisted again this is a huge 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 problem and uh, this is the kind of stuff that does happen when you start building your own sites. And, you know, you, you need to, you know, be security minded um, and you have to kind of be reluctant about, you know, installing some of these plugins because remember, yeah. they're free stuff that's free. Yep. You know, the guy that's writing it, he's not worrying about your security. He's just writing something because, you know, he's he's done work for the day and he wants to, you know, play with some code a little, you know, for uh, right. a couple hours at night. Yeah. So, you know, you need to be careful. You really need to be careful because it is your reputation. It's your reputation. And I tell you what, your site comes up as a black blacklisted and and your bride, let's say, is going or your client is going to your site and they get this site that, you know, this page that says this yep. site is, you know, um, uh, has, bl you know, so it's black blacklisted and yeah, it has it's malware, malware on it. Yeah. Don't go to this site, and then it basically gives you the ability to go, you know, keep going to the site, but at your own risk. No one's going to your site. You're no. done. <laughs> That's the end of it. Yeah, no they're going to think, oh, my God, where am I? Yeah, exactly. exactly. This, I, this guy is not reliable. I mean, he, his site is full of malware. I don't want to go there. Right. So, yeah, it's it's a huge problem. Um, you know, definitely we'll have it in the show notes where you can go and check to see if you have the vulnerability. If you do, definitely patch Tim Thumb right away. Um, my suggestion is, you know, get rid of Tim Thumb altogether. Go with a different, you know, package. I'll give you an example. Graph Paper Press. Uh, what is it? Graph Paper Press. That's who it is. Um, right. They did an entire article on this. And um, because most, the majority of their um, themes had this uh, uh, Tim Thumb in it. They're right. getting rid of it completely. They're going with something else. And they're telling people instead of upgrade, just, just kill it. Um, kill it. And then when the if you're using those themes, update the themes when they Up, become available. Update the theme, right. The only problem with- you are vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, a little, the little, the little scary, scary bit there. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. But I think we need to get going. I hate to end on a scary note, but it gives people something to think about. And at least, you know, hopefully we help some people out to be able to find, you know, try to see if they're vulnerable or not. Well, that's it. I mean, you've got to be aware of these different things that are going on out there. You know, we're we're out here in it every day. We're looking at stuff all the time. And if, right. we, if we find something like this, we definitely want to share it with you guys to right. at least make you aware of it. Yeah, we're in the trenches, as they say. And me being in a system trenches. administrator also, I get to see the back end and how this stuff all works. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. I get I get a, uh, let's say, instead of a bird's eye, I'm actually in there with a microscope seeing the stuff. So it's pretty nasty. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, all right, man, let's get out of here. Um, thanks again to everybody for uh, joining us. And if you guys uh, ever write a post about us or want to write a, a quick review for us in iTunes, you know, that we'd really appreciate it. Um, just let us know about it so we can go take a look. And we'd love to give you a shout out on the show and add your information into uh, our Friends of the Show page. So, Joe, awesome. if people want to learn more about you, how can they connect with you? They can find me on Twitter. That's the easiest way. At Joseph Christina, and that's Christina without an H. Great. And you can keep up with me on Twitter. It's at Trevor Curran. Excellent. All right, Trev. Listen, show 68 is in the can. Great show as always. 
If you guys have any questions or topics you'd like discussed on next week's show, send us a message through our website, digitalphotographycafe.com. Or you can connect with us on Twitter, at dphotocafe. Love Twitter, love Twitter. If you're listening on the go, fear not. Everything that we covered in this week's show can easily be found in our show notes at our website. Once again, keep your questions and comments coming, and we'll talk to you next week.